I've written a couple of stories with other people and I'd never considered writing a book with anybody else until Cass and I started talking. It just, because it's such a commitment um, and you have to trust the other person and like their work and know, know that they can know that they can do it. And our styles are different enough that we could each bring something different to, to the story and to the actual telling of the story. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 74 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Same as last week, my co-host, the Chewy to my hand solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, MJ Kuhn, isn't joining us, but we miss you, MJ. And if anyone wants to support her work, you can go pick up Among Thieves, this beautiful little novel, fast-paced heists, and some morally gray characters. I know you're going to love it. You can also pick up the sequel, Thick as Thieves, if you want to support her and her writing. As well, a quick note for anyone out there listening or watching the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app, and subscribe to the FanFighter YouTube channel, where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, joining us once again is the darkest duo in the land, ha ha ha, co-authors of the brand new novel, The Dead Take the A Train, Cassandra Ka and Richard Kadri. How are you two today? Hello. Hello. Thank you. Oh, how are you? Doing very well. That darkest duo was for you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, man. All right. The heads up, this is part two of our two-part chat with Cass and Richard. So I recommend checking out part one to get to know them better. Today, though, we're doing a duet, delving into a master class on co-writing a novel. So to start off, uh, Cass, we'll go with you first. When was the first time each of you realized books could actually be written by more than one person? I think a long time ago, we've all read books that had co-writers. Um, Good Omens, I think, being the template of it for so many people. So like, we always knew it was possible. It was just a question of how... How to make it happen, I guess. Do you have a yeah. uh, personal favorite co-authored book? Good Omens, definitely Good Omens. I, I could like it. Love Although it. I really like the Expand series quite a bit. Yeah, I'm, bo- yes, I'm on board for both. I hadn't both thought books. of that. That's yeah. right. I forgot about Expands. I always forget that Expands is done that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which says a lot to their talent. Yeah, Daniel and, and, and Ty are amazing writers. Um Richard, what about you? When was the first time you realized that, or at least noticed, like, this book is written by two people? I think as a kid reading science fiction pulp novels, um, I can't remember many of the names, but uh, I, I remember one with Judith Merrill and maybe Kuttner writing a book together, and that seemed very exotic to me, if for no other reason than their names. Kuttner <laughs> and Merrill sounded like... Uh, a detective agency. <laughs> and then yeah, you, you go up a bit. And I, I think both of the titles that Cass mentioned are just great ones. And I was kind of fascinated by the idea of how people wrote together. And of course, I, I grew up with film too. And you always see multiple people writing movies and television. So that was already in my head that like, this is possible. Yeah. And especially with movies and television, it's like, not just two authors sometimes they're three four screenwriters working working on on a script together and and well i'll tell you they're not working on it together i'll tell you that (laughs) that's not how that if you see five names on a script first off it's a mess and secondly probably two of those uh, are like people who came into like (laughs) what do they call uh, script doctors is that is that the the term script doctors don't usually get get credit because i've done some script doctoring Um, no, if there's five names on there, that's a bunch of people who are fighting it out with the writer's guild and okay. just, I want my name on there because it gives you certain <laughs> prestige and money yeah. and there's other guild stuff, but, um, those five people did not write that together. They probably hate each other because you changed my script and I changed your script. And anyway, it's, it's, it's a very funny process because I've, 
I've been on, I've been part of that a couple right. of times and no one likes when you're the new guy who comes in and changes mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. I'm just thinking of a movie like Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, how mm-hmm. that just went through so many it was just a mess of a movie to begin with. Uh yes. But or not to begin with to end with uh as something to watch, but then like going through the credits and everything it's like, "Oh, okay. That makes sense." But for you two in particular, your book is fantastic and it's not a mess. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> how did your co-authoring relationship begin? You know, like who approached who uh, and, and what made you both want to, to write a novel together? Um, I wanted to try co-writing first and I think Richard had been curious about it before. And also this was sort of like, almost a trading grounds because he'd heard me wheel incessantly about being afraid of writing novels. I'm like, I can do novellas. I can't do novels. <laughs> I was like, yeah. you can absolutely do novels. Yeah, yeah. And in many ways, this was him helping to steer me through that fear of writing novels, especially outlines. I remember the first time he tried to drag me off for an outline meeting, I basically wailed about it forever because I was not used to the idea of outlines. And now I'm writing 10,000 word outlines. Yeah. Um, but that was just kind of how it started. We kept talking about it and kept getting excited about the idea. And eventually came up with a terrible system in the beginning that we had to revise to figure out our individual quirks. Well, why was that? Yeah, it seems so the... simple. It seems so simple in the beginning, and then we that. just 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 a, a complete train wreck. Ah, oh, God, yes. So our initial idea was dividing up the chapters depending on what each person found um, interesting, and that was fine for me because I work in the games industry, and half the time when I'm writing, I'm writing in a black box. I don't know what's happening anywhere else, and there are pauses that are done. To make everything make sense. Uh, but then we discovered uh, Richard actually needed the context of previous chapters. And I was so behind on mine <clears throat> that he ended up flailing through his. And then I had immigration stuff that I needed to deal with. Um, then you also had hip surgery. So that became incredibly chaotic for both of us. Eventually, we settled on the realization what made more sense was one person doing a pass and then the other one following up and doing your own pass over it. And that worked out really well because that meant each person could have their distinctive voice there. But then as the other person did the other pass, adding things or removing things, you, I guess, instinctively edit based on your existing voice. So he would trim down on my prose, which tends to be very Baroque. And I would... <clears throat> run into fight scenes or gory, scary scenes and just slatter it with even more buckets of entrails <laughs> because that is my happy place. Oh, man. Okay, so Cass, you touched on a bunch of points that I that I want to dig into a little bit deeper. But before we get into that, I kind of want to uh, pick your brains about why the dead take the A train was the idea that stuck. You know, if you if either of you had had previous ideas for books that you wanted to write, uh, with someone else or with each other, or just like an idea that comes to you and you think, ah, oh, this would be a really good co-author kind of, kind of project. Um, but why was it that the dead take the A train was the book that made sense for you two as co-writers? I think it's because we love New York and we both have yeah. urban fantasy backgrounds, Richard Borso and I. I think so. And I think, I mean, really, I haven't really, I've written a couple of stories with other people and I'd never considered writing a book with anybody else until Cass and I started talking. It just, because it's such a commitment um, and you have to trust the other person and like their work and know, know that they can know that they can do it. And, and our styles. Like yes. And our styles are different enough that we could each bring something different to to the story and to the actual telling of the story. Yeah. Cause that's, that's something that I've been, I've been thinking about a lot. It's like going into the debut experience and already knowing I would love to write a book with someone else one day, you know, I've, 
already spoken to a couple of friends, MJ being one of them, about like, it would be really fun to write a book with you. But I don't know if it's advisable for a, a debut author to tackle that so early on in their writing journey, you know? So I wanted to get your opinions in terms of when do you recommend an author would take on something like co-writing? You know, if it's advisable for an author to kind of find themselves first and write solo works and establish their voice as opposed to jumping right into it. Or do you think it's more a matter of like right co-author, right time, like right person, right project? I think you need to be confident about your voice before you enter anything like that. If you are sure of who you are and you are sure of your writing now, I don't think that like, I don't think it's a bad idea to start co-writing immediately. But if you're still in a phase where you're a little bit hesitant, you're trying to figure out who and what you want to be. And you might find yourself intimidated or upset or frustrated at somebody writing over your prose or pushing things here and there, then it's worth waiting. But really, it depends on you. I think it's the other part what Cass just said is also letting go of ego the idea of somebody rewriting your work um we know each other we like each other we trust each other so the ego part of it never came up but you know if you're not sure of the other person i can see if you if you're not sure of the other person if you're unsure of yourself i can see ego becoming you know part uh, could be a problem along the way yeah, because ego can even be a problem just for an individual author working on their own project. Because mm-hmm. it's like, sure, you this struggle with your own ego to say like, you know, is it worth writing this? Kind of imposter syndrome uh, type thoughts yeah. sinking in. Is it worth writing this? Is it going to find an audience? Why the fuck am, are my ideas worth it? Or, you know, coming up against barriers in terms of not feeling confident about your work and all these different kinds of things. But Richie, you brought up a point where it's like the ego thing, but also um, finding someone that you can kind of connect with in the sense that you know, based on your relationship with the person, that this has a high possibility of, of working out and us being able to have a good collaborative experience together. How might authors out there go about finding the right person to co-author with? I know this is a really like, situational uh kind of kind of thing but Mm. obviously there 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 are signs that it might not work um you know like the ego thing or have either of you tried doing this before and maybe it didn't work out the way that you thought it would i've like i said i can't word up go ahead sorry you first I covered a couple of stories and that turned out all right. And I think both because Cass is a game writer and is used to working in a room where ideas are being talked about and you're servicing the bigger project. And I've done a little game work and I've done film and TV stuff. And it's the same thing where you're all servicing the story. And if someone's ego gets out of line, that person you know, um, that person sometimes doesn't end up in the project, but, you know, having the experience of, and the, and the understanding of servicing the greater good makes a lot of difference. Uh, Yeah, I agree with Richard. I think it really does go back to the ego thing and you can see it from the way they interact with other people, the way they interact with other people's books, whether they support the community, whether they're kind about it. Somebody who's very rigid, very focused on themselves and no one else. Um, that's usually a sign they might not be the best person to collaborate with. Yeah. 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 The other thing is, I mean, for me, I used to be in bands And one of the things you learn from being in bands is if you have a great guitarist, but he's an asshole, he's going to ruin the band. Yeah. (laughs) Because that one asshole can drag the whole thing down. So if you're going to colllaborate, it's got to be with people you click with. Yeah. And it's like, I think that's a real. 
at that point you might you might already be developing friendships with with people in the community and if you can form mm-hmm. good friendships then um those are probably the people that you're already clicking with and therefore you can kind of suss out like what's your what's your workflow like like what's your approach to writing mm-hmm. um how might we be able to to kind of meld our two approaches together in a way that is mm-hmm. that is productive you know because it's like that asshole guitarist eventually people are going i don't want to be in your fucking band like i don't want to be in the band with you i don't want to be your friend or whatever it's right like shitty people yeah. sinking ships like i don't want to be on that ship with you <laughs> exactly yeah and um cass earlier you brought up uh the the thing about voice in terms of you and richard merging your voices together in terms of like your writing style being more baroque and his being a bit more lean and all that kind of stuff but i think finding a voice as an author is something that i've thought a lot about um but do you want to elaborate a bit on this notion of finding a voice and style as co-authors and as like a unified uh, team? I feel like all of my answers are going to be essentially the same at this point. Finding that composite voice, I think, was a lot about trust. It was knowing that when Richard removed things or reworded things, it wasn't because he thought of my work as poor or as something he didn't enjoy. I knew he loved my work. I knew he trusted what I was to doing and everything was to make the book better. And getting that composite voice, I think, meant leaning completely into that sense of trust. Um, the way I think... Uh, one of the earlier chapters, I remember you left a lot of like gruesome scenes that were entirely unfleshed out. And I just ran over with them and just lengthened all the fights and brutality in it in a very happy that. way. Yeah. I remember um, that. And I asked you about it and you were like, yeah, I was writing the chapter and I was sure that Cass would just add an appropriate amount of gore afterwards. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, sometimes, goes back sometimes if you know the other person's going to do something better than you in a way you want in a collaboration. Yeah. You can just leave that little thing of like, Bob kills Jeff with an ax. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you just take it from there. That is genuinely kind of what happens. I love that. Yeah. Were there, what were some other things like other, other strengths that, that you knew the other person had that you were like, I'm just going to leave this, you know, just a little, a little note be like, yeah. flesh this out like add some stuff to it i know you're better at this than me what are some other things that, have, that you know about the other person that you think it's like i know you do this better than i do uh i have richard feel uh feel free to i think ask adrian to cut this section if you're not comfortable with it because the story okay. is gonna be funny uh drugs <laughs> i have no experience with drugs outside of marijuana and that's only something i got into like when i was 35 or 36 yeah yeah uh, because I grew up in Malaysia where there was capital punishment for even smallest amount of drugs. If you're caught with uh, a certain amount of weed, you're just going to get dragged up and hung. That's it. And so growing up in that environment it was kind of beaten into me. If you are in the same room as somebody having drugs, there is a not zero chance you are going to die. Uh, so with Julie being so it to cook and all kind of designer drugs and kind of looked at Richard and we're like, how does any of this work? Yeah. It's like, Richard, get on in here. Yeah. Um, I have to admit, people take drugs and people smoke in my books because I don't do either one anymore. Yeah. So, but you did. But I, that's, a, that's, his, the, that's his vice now. His vice is, is representing it on the page. Yeah. Uh, well, other things too. But... <laughs> Um, I don't do cocaine anymore. And I don't smoke anymore, but I love both of them so much. <laughs> um, and so, and I thought, I don't drink vodka all the time, but I, but vodka pairs very well with uh, cocaine. So that became Julie's central focus in yeah. her bad habits. I think uh, I, I, I just did a little post uh, earlier in the week about the book. Uh, on on social media, and I I wrote a cocaine and vodka fueled thrill ride <laughs> through New York, and uh, 
feel like <laughs> that that kind yeah. of that kind of uh, amped up nature really really fit with Julie as a character, but also just like I, I love hearing this kind of uh, behind the scenes stuff as well. <laughs> well anyway, I mean, part we're talking about New York in the other interview, and I mean. Cocaine, vodka, and New York just seem to me go so well together because you get that weird cocaine liquor buzz going, and then you're in New York. So that means you can go out and get Korean food at 4 a.m. because you can't sleep. But there'll be one of those hot tray places around the corner. And so you can finish off your night just filling up those little um, styrofoam bowls with food and that's just it's kind of a perfect new york evening <laughs> and just like walking around the city. not anymore not anymore though if there are any cops watching <laughs> not anymore there are no autoclaves in my office and richard doesn't there right in his. <laughs> and i do not have any dr- uh, cocaine in my apartment yeah no that's great though because I, I i appreciate that you both s- you know, and this kind of ties into the, the, the friendship thing and the relationship that you build with this other person that you're co-writing with is, is understanding, uh, nuances and, and, and strengths about their writing and, and, um, appreciating the work that they've put out in the past and knowing, applying to this project in particular, Cass could do this thing really well. Of course, you're going to bring on the body horror and just like throw down those gnarly, gnarly action scenes and, viscera and guts and all that beautiful stuff and and just like the rawness that richard brings um i think it's really special to see authors that are able to do this and i think for anyone out there who wants to co-author i think it is really important to to trust the person that you're writing with and to get to know them it's like the more the more and more you become friends with somebody um the more you pick up on the the nuances of their their life and their history and yeah. all these different kinds of things that can really add amazing elements to a story, I think. And that's why The Dead Take the A-Train, for me, feels very strong is because there's so much about both of you in this book, you know, from, like, the way that Julie runs across, like, a uh an old man in the park and she's trying to tell him like get the fuck out of here and i could just i could just kind of picture in my head like this feels like something that cass has experienced (laughs) you know what i mean um and just all these different moments where you manage this cohesion but you also manage to give it um the your your individual personalities um and that's probably that's probably a very difficult balance for people to find um, is, and that's something like why good omens is such an amazing book. Why the expanse is such an amazing series is because authors who are able to infuse themselves, but also make it feel cohesive so that the reader isn't pulled out of the experience, I think is a very tricky balance, but if you can pull it off, it's magic. Yeah. Well, I mean, liking each other's work, but liking each other as people, I think those are two, I think those are the two bases. You have to work for very important basis because you're going to be in this for a while and there's going to be, (laughs) there's going to be big (laughs) chunks of time where uh, be big, there'd be a certain amount of time where you're going, I'm lost. You're going to have to help me here. (laughs) I have, I don't know where I am anymore. (laughs) But that's the ego thing too, to be able to admit, well, shit, I'm lost. That is a, to be able to, to, supersede your own ego and admit that to another person is like we're in this together and i have to tell you i don't know what the fuck is going on and being yeah. able to work together to then resolve that that situation is is really important and cast you were mentioning a little bit about the the writing process and how that evolved earlier but i want to dig deeper into the the way that you two drafted this book um and if you could, you know, I want to get Richard's take on this as well. The, the, the sort of stage that you got to where you were doing, uh, writing a chapter and doing sort of doing a pass on the previous chapter and then writing a new chapter and that back and forth and how that kind of unfolded in such a way where you two felt like, 
our writing and our styles and our voices are merging in a way that's functioning for this. Did we ever feel that? We tr remember we tried doing the, I'll write one chapter, then you rewrite it and then you'll give it back to me. And like, basically we'd ended up with like two chapters with 10 drafts and it's like, Oh, we have to keep going. So many drafts. So many drafts. <laughs> so many drafts. And that's when we realized we, we need to write longer chunks and then give the longer yes. piece to each other. Ah, that was okay. the, it, it really took a while to figure that out. Yeah. But when we figured out like, no, 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 no. One person has to yes, haul this it. boulder up the hill. And then the other person, when it gets there, pulls it up the other hill. The next hill. Yeah. So it's like this, this like game of baton, but like, yes, Sisyphus, very much so. Sisyphus baton. There you go. <laughs> it you did go. result in later on when we we're getting our final page passes, every time our editor sent the book back, we would scream very softly at each other <laughs> like, over a text. Oh, God, it's the book. I can't make it go away. Yes. Oh, man. What, what about deadlines? Did you, did you two at any point think like. We didn't make to... it. Just stop your question. We just did, stop your question. We did not make any of her deadlines. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I had an international it. move oh, and he had hip surgery. We made none of her deadlines. Yeah. None of them. <laughs> We're just very lucky our editors trusted in us. Yeah. That we would actually finish it someday. Yes. Yeah. You made it work. You made it work. How how was yes, it how was it working with uh Tor Night Fire and you know going through all of the madness of this experience and then entering into like revision stage, editing stage, and then editing with with Tor Night Fire and you know moments where either the two of you were discussing like does something need to be cut or you wanted to fight to keep it, or if Tor was saying like, can we cut this or can we trim this down or anything like that? I think Richard was more attached to certain parts of the book than I was like working yeah. in the games industry. I'm just so used <laughs> to dragging my darlings out to the back of the shed and just shooting them in the head. Yeah. Uh, like I feel I like your version of kill your different. darlings would be a bit more brutal than just shooting them in the head. Excuse me, I appreciate economy. <laughs> just one bullet, get it done. <laughs> Just one bullet, yes. You gotta, you gotta be efficient with these things, man. Uh, yeah. There were parts there were I, bits, yeah. that, that, that they took stuff out that made me unhappy. But then there was stuff, I think each of us had moments where it's like, nope, you can't take that out. And here's why. Or you, you can't take it out or you can't reframe it. There was a long story Julie tells Sarah that her editors wanted – to take and us to make into an adventure but the whole purpose of her telling sarah a story was that intimate act of storytelling that getting reacquainted with someone here's my life we didn't need to tell that as a separate adventure sarah and julie had to bond at that moment of storytelling because that's like i said their their story is an intimate one, and that activity is an intimate one. And I think that was – so we fought for that. We fought for that. Yeah, because it's like it's it's removing the potency of this, this relationship building for the sake mm -hmm. of here's like a – I don't know, like a – An action side, scene. A side novella or like a, a little yeah. like short story on the side or just some sort of thing that would take away from the – the true power that that act has, you know, in, in yeah. its meta form of like the power of story within a story itself, building yep. that relationship through that. Yeah. And so but for they also, they cut our entire first pair, our first chapter. Which <laughs> you is, were so indignant about I was that. I remember. So ups I love that first <laughs> chapter so much. I loved that first chapter, but they were right. Jumping. My first chapter idea was very artsy, and uh, I'm not going to go into it. It hurts, still hurts. But the idea of starting Julie's story where Cass started it, just blasting into the bachelorette party, was the perfect thing to do. Literally just, I would say, just exploding into the... <laughs> 
mm-hmm. just erupting into the bachelorette party. Erupting is a good word <laughs> for that yeah. whole scene. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good um, tonal uh, kind of like mood setter. It's like, this is what mm-hmm. you can expect, you know? Yeah. Um, There's a lot of erupting throughout the book. <laughs> Lots of erupting. But for the two of you, okay, so you did the majority of this book virtually. Mm-hmm. How did you yes. go about that in terms of uh, were you doing calls with each other? Um, how much of it was, you know, sending an email or a text message or that kind of stuff? We're, what would you recommend? We're for chronically people? online. <laughs> yeah. What would you recommend for, for people like if you were going to co-write virtually some tips and tricks uh, for for approaching it? Have a messenger system that you really like. We use Telegram for that, and that was useful. Find something that's pleasant to read, pleasant on your eyes, that supports a lot of text, because you will inevitably want to send chunks of story to one another. Sometimes just to show off the cool new thing that you've done or to ask the other person's opinion of a thing. So have a messaging system that you like. Really, that's the main thing. We did it almost entirely via text, except for the outline planning. Yeah, there was there were a couple of Zoom things, but it was mostly just because yeah. it's, I mean it's a book. We don't you you want to live in words, so we just hurled words back and forth, like Cass said. Oh, I like that. Yeah, because I mean, email would get too clunky; it would get too overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, Very. Yeah, and obviously there are times where having a a, a video call really helps just to to hash things out, but. I like the. It, I like it can what you speed said, Richard. Uh, in terms of a call, terms can speed of, things up sometimes. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say I really like what you said in terms of living in the words, like that. You're writing a book, and it feels like the right format to to collaborate in that way. Yeah. But what were you going to say? You no, know, I'm saying sometimes a call can can speed things up. You can have five emails or five discussions back and forth, but sometimes a, a quick call could cut through stuff. But Again, we were pretty good with each other in any case, so that um, having to do calls was was very seldom. Um, it was, in some ways, it was more fun to do it through something like Telegram because you'd be sitting there working on your own bit, and then suddenly this huge chunk of story would just <laughs> appear, and it was just like yeah. this little magic, oh. this little magic trick that meant you could quit work for a couple of minutes and go read somebody else's bit. Yeah. But that's inspiring at the same time, you know, Mm -hmm. to go and read their stuff and just be like, fuck yes. Obviously you have some, some critiques and and whatever in there, but, but, uh, something that, that I like to do, uh, my friend Ronnie Verdi actually does this uh, too, is like, while you're writing to just dip into a a book, um, for five, 10 minutes, something like that, and then come back to your writing and kind of use one to sort of fuel and facilitate the other. Um, sure. Yeah. Sorry, I yep. might have to jump early. I think one of the cats is having a stomach ache, and if I don't tend to it, I'm going to spend the rest of the night cleaning to be very delicate about it. No worries, Cass. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Yeah. And I, I trust Richard not to say anything very strange for the rest of the master class. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Take care. It's going to be kind. See you oh, later. I'll talk Thank to you later, Cass. Cass. Thank, Thank you, you so time. much for having me again, My Andrew. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, it was really good to meet you. <laughs> Um, Richard, so let's dig uh, a little bit deeper into some co-writing craft stuff. Um, yeah. in terms of approaching story aspects, like characters and world building dialogue, action, that kind of thing. Um, obviously trying to make sure that they're both collaborative and consistent from like an ideation standpoint. And then like Cass was mentioning earlier, she'd jump in there and kind of flesh out the action, uh, bits. Um, so do you want to, do you want to dig into that a bit? Yeah. Well, um, one of the things was, as as Cass said earlier, um, they didn't have quite as much experience with outlining and story structure as I did on a big project. They had done tons of novellas and stories, but on a huge project, like a book, they didn't have quite as much uh, experience. So at the beginning, I kind of took uh, some of that on. And then as things developed, 
the story the, the, the story structure came started coming from both of us because it was just it, it's that thing of building on ideas it's like yeah. well here's an idea oh i have an idea oh that's great because i had this other idea and we can just you keep piling things on top of each other yeah, and i like that some of those scenes just became some of the bits of the book simply became it's interesting looking back on some of them like there's a character of the doorman in a hotel and i remember i came up with the doorman and then there's a scene with julie and brad in the hotel and we both worked on that and i have no idea who did who kind of did what with that scene anymore because we both went over it a lot so that's kind of a nice feeling of like I know I came up with one part of it. The rest of it is just us. But that, that's that's the beauty of it is like the yeah, it getting it getting to a point of unconscious collaboration. Um, mm-hmm. And I know what scene you're talking. I know this character, and it's a fantastic scene. And someone who uh, is such a small piece of the overall puzzle, the overall novel, but. Um, the two of you managed to create in very few words, a character that feels very real. Um, and thank you. And, and is obviously super humorous too. And, and that's something else I wanted to touch on is the, is, was the humor that is sprinkled throughout this book? Cause obviously there's a lot of horror. There's a lot of, uh, really you know, visceral scenes. There are a lot of really emotional moments. There are a lot of, uh, amazing, you know, parts of like relationship building and all this different kind of stuff. How did you two find that emotional balance in terms of this feels like a natural moment for, uh, humor and release, or this feels like a good time for emotional scene and we're not going to throw a bunch of eldritch horror or like body horror into there. So how did you, how did you two find that balance, at least from your perspective? Some of it simply comes from experience. A lot of it simply comes from experience and trusting ourselves and each other. Because I'm a big believer in humor in, in, um, dark fantasy and horror, although it doesn't always appear in my horror. But in a book <laughs> like this, it needed, with, with the ca- cast of characters and the setting we had, it needed moments of levity. Because that's who Julie was also. That's her character is someone who's not on the surface going to take things seriously, but underneath takes everything very seriously. So it was kind of a balance of that. And, you know, that's, uh, that's a trick. I don't think I can tell anybody because it's, it just comes from the experience of, Oh, this beat here, this is little moment right here where we need to break things. And that means a moment of horror or a moment of humor. And you go along a little further and then the rhythm becomes, well, this is a, uh, an, an intimate talking scene with no horror, no nothing else, just two people um, having an emotional moment together. And just that balance of loud and quiet. And a lot of that ju- is just, it's just comes from having done so much of this stuff before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I love the, I love how you, how you paired humor and horror as the way to break the the that that kind of moment where it's like um who is it that i was speaking to about this uh kevin hearn was speaking about Mm. the the relationship between humor and and horror and how they play on similar um psychological traits within within human beings but the delivery is different the the ultimate delivery is different so i I like how you how you kind of paired those things together because Humor and horror do play really well together. Uh, and oh, they do. Is, and Kevin's a, good a, at a it. Shining example. Kevin's good at that stuff. Oh, 
Kevin is amazing at it. Yeah. yeah. Were there any other moments during the writing of this book that, that, that really surprised you? I was like, holy shit. Like I didn't expect this character to, to, to appear or, or to, for this relationship to play out in however way, or for something to happen. Um, that just really made you shocked and like, Oh shit, this is, this is amazing. Or this is really, you know, I'm trying to think. Well, one fun thing was, uh, I think I came up with Dan, Julie's ex boyfriend, and I knew he was going to be a bad guy. And then that almost became a game of, I wrote some Dan and then Cass wrote some Dan and made him worse. And it's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to take Dan back and I'm going to make him worse. And then we kind of, that just became a, uh, a kind of game with Dan, who was a horrible person to begin with figuring out between the two was like, well, how far can Dan go? Uh, and that was, there was a little, there was a little going back and forth on that, but I think we got a nice balance of like how awful Dan could be. That was sort of, that was, that was the name of the game. How awful can Dan be? Oh, competing. I'm, I'm sorry, another. Tyler. Di- Dan's bad, but Tyler's the one that um, yeah, yeah. we kind of played with more. Yeah. Dan is, um, he's the husband. Sarah's ex. Sarah's, yeah. Sarah's husband. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, Tyler, Tyler, yeah, Tyler's the person where it's like, because you get POV chapters inside his head, so you can kind of see him right. internalizing the moments where his boundaries are being pushed. Yeah. And so that is even more satisfying to be like, how far are you going to go, man? And then he goes in a, in a direction that you didn't expect. And you're like, Oh yeah. shit, I want bad things to happen yeah, to thanks. you because you're horrible. <laughs> some of, some of Tyler for me was exorcising my memory of working in corporate settings. Yeah. After the two of you mentioned that, I was like, this feels like just therapy. For <laughs> there's, a, there's a bit Corporate there's always therapy. a bit of that in a big in a big project <laughs> yeah yeah all right so closing out i want to do a little bit of uh pros and cons um after okay. everything we've discussed what are some of the the biggest benefits of co-writing with another author and what have from your perspective been some of the biggest uh challenges or downsides the biggest advantage for me was Having one idea, the story is going to go like this, the character is going to go like this, and then have someone else come in and go, but what if we did this to them? What if we twisted them and made, made this whole thing different? And then so that piling on of ideas, of getting, of uh, finding words or ideas or characters that you wouldn't have come to, that somebody else brings in, and then you get to play with them together. That's great. I loved that. Um, the challenges were literally writing it. That took us a while to figure out through, you know, like I, we said earlier, we started out doing small units and handing them off, but that was just a disaster. Realizing later on that we had to do very big chunks and then let that go back and forth. And some of that stuff was just Really, at at the end of the project, like each of us was literally rewriting the book. We talk, we go to the editors, and they'd ask questions, and one of us would take it back and go a whole pass, give it back, get more questions, then the other person made a whole pass through. So, yeah, it it, it, it it's a little brutal, um, but you know, um, I do think it made everything come together in a in a decent way. Yeah. Well, I, I really enjoyed the book, so I can, I can definitely attest to that. Uh, and I've heard other authors who, who obviously this approach is very much um, uh, a matter of the authors that are involved. Because I've heard uh, from friends who have co-written, and it would be kind of like one person, maybe it's like a multi-POV uh, book, where one person writes one POV and the other person writes another. Um, and they just go back and forth in terms of the POVs uh, or Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, it's like they would write a lot of the chapters together uh, and just kind of brainstorm and play video games and, and, and let the ideas flow. And they would do like back and forth kind of thing uh, in that way as well. Um, but I think 
for any authors out there who want to co-write a novel, if you could give a final piece of advice to them, uh, what would it be? Find someone you trust and then figure out your process afterwards. But you have to have that human relationship to begin with. That's the most important part. If you're going to think about writing a book with somebody, you already like their writing. So you, and writing a book is a long, complicated process. So you better be prepared to uh, be with them for a long time in a complicated, sometimes really pressurized setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I like that. Because it, it, it digs into the realities of it. It's like, you got to love writing. You got to yep. appreciate the person and trust them. Trust them to trust them in such a way where you can put your ego aside and yeah. trust yourself enough to have the confidence to work with that person and collaborate with them. And yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. Like I could, I can just tell from the way that you and Cass described it, how difficult it is, but I think it's a fascinating way to experience writing a book. Um, and something that I personally am very much looking forward to one day and doing this masterclass was a big part of it was, was me and, and MJ as well, wanting to, to learn as much as we could about how you two approach this, uh, approach this book. And there's a lot in here that people can take away from it. So I really appreciate you, uh, you and Cass imparting all of your wisdom and madness <laughs> and everything. And, uh, oh. Sharing, sharing more about the experience of writing the dead take the train. Thanks a lot. I, I hope it was some of this was helpful. Yeah, for sure. And, um, that's it for this mini masterclass and our two parter with Cassandra Ka and Richard Kadri. Cassandra had to dip out early, uh, because of cats, but thank you to her as well for, for, uh, joining us. And thank you, Richard, for sharing your co-writing experience and, 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 um, just, taking time out of your evening to, to hang out with me. So I really appreciate it. And um, it's a really nice time. Thank you very much for having you. me. Yeah. And if uh, you could let folks know where they can find you online. Sure. You can find me on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on blue sky and I'm on Instagram. Um, just pretty much Google my name and it'll pull all that stuff up. Perfect. So and um, I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. And Cassandra, I think she mentioned Instagram and TikTok are the main ones for her, correct? TikTok and Instagram, yes. Perfect. At Cass Call on Instagram, and I forget what they are on TikTok. Hopefully it's the same. I will put links in the description below, so don't worry about that anymore. Right. <laughs> uh, you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at SFF Addicts Pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. Uh, MJ is at MJ Coon Books all over the place, blue sky, Twitter, everywhere. You can also pick up Among Thieves and Thick as Thieves to go support her work. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts.